before we move on from Vietnam, I just wanted to ask you, you told me, you know, you had to play different types of music for the, the, the grunts and different kinds of music for the officers and uh -huh. were there any, yeah. other, were there any other kind of musical happenings or anything that influenced you over there musically? Um, there were, um, there were two kinds of, or yeah, two kinds of band over there, um, playing music and, uh, they were either Filipinos or Vietnamese playing in Vietnam or Australians and American bands were over there playing. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, they tried to cover as much of whatever they knew, you know. Uh, I couldn't imagine, even though I did hear Vietnamese bands, uh, they were, in essence, trying to play <laughs> American music, but with a Vietnamese accent. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> and what kind were they play just trying to play the hip hits of the day? Yeah, yeah. And one of the hits that they were playing was uh that song, You're my Venus, oh you're my that and my desire. You know, I heard it from the rock you know for I mean I'll never forget it. And uh, the um, the bands over there, they they would make the uh, amplifiers over there. You couldn't bring your own amplifier from here, so everything sounded like shit. You know, uh, they but had, uh, they had Vietnamese amplifiers. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and, and Filipino amplifiers, and uh, uh, it's just that, you know, they didn't have, we, we couldn't bring over Fender amps or whatever else was around, because it weighed too much, you know? Yeah. So, uh, anyway, that was uh, the extent of it. Um, Did the Filipinos and Vietnamese get the feel of the music? Um, the uh, Vietnamese were just doing what a, you know, they were copying what they thought was the music without understanding the language or, you know, they just went on the feel of the thing, uh, and didn't know what the hell they were saying, so it, it just sounded so funny. Because uh, all they were trying to do, you know, they were, they learned the song, but they didn't know what they were learning. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't know the, the language, they didn't know anything, so, uh, you know, and they, and they were trying to, um, be rock and roll artists or country artists or whatever they were, you know. Uh, the Filipinos uh, were, you know, trying to imitate, uh, you know, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., that kind of thing. Yeah, they like that. They like kind of balladeer uh, music there, don't they? Balladeer. Yeah. I've noticed that about. I had a friend from the Philippines and uh, later, but they seem to really go for that. So, what happens after Vietnam? Well, uh, after we came back, I quit the band. In fact, the entire band quit. Birch because Birch was uh, I mean the guy went over there and got filthy rich you know 
And uh, he didn't pay us anything, so uh, we all quit him when we came back. And I just uh, went back to Billings. Uh, my old man uh, kind of abandoned my mom and I, went back to Greece in 67. Uh, he, you know, realized once he was over there that uh, there was nothing there for him, you know. Uh, he thought that he would find everything the way he left it back in 57, you know. But all of his friends had, you know, children and families to deal with, and they all looked at him kind of funny and were saying, well, where's your wife and where's your son? And, you know, yeah. why just leave them and all that? So um, he was like a man without a country. So when he came back, um... He moved down to Denver and uh, and got his the same kind of job going down there that he had in uh, Billings. But Mom and I, uh, we just uh, hunkered down and, you know, she was working at Bender's auction and I was... Uh, making a few bucks as a musician around Billings. Um, about that time, about 73, 74, I just started writing more of my own things and doing a solo gig. Um, you know, got myself a little Fender PA system and... Uh, and uh, an ovation guitar and started singing moody blues songs and blah 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 and playing at pizza houses and and things to that effect and you know making 150 bucks a week and surviving back then you could do it you know um uh, and then around 74 um I started getting a little notoriety around the state, so I was branching out, leaving uh, Billings to play and going up to Missoula and playing places like the Top Hat. And uh, did then... You, did you end up having a band or was this all solo? It was solo in the beginning. So, I mean, I would play in these little um, listening environments where... Um, and, and people went nuts, you know, so hell, I, I started, you know, making 500 bucks a night or whatever, you know, uh, and filling up these rooms and, and. So you kind of came a star in Montana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Roger Miller thing was happening. Okay. Yeah. And what do you mean? Yeah. What do you mean by that? The Roger Miller thing was happening. No, a uh, Kansas City Star. Oh. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. So you did that to uh, you did the solo thing around Montana and surrounding areas through the mm -hmm. through the seventies. Yeah, mostly in the early seventies, up through about seventy four, seventy five, and then. Around 75, um, I started playing with other people again and forming my own bands, and my songwriting uh, was getting stronger. Um, people were coming to hear me for my stuff and for uh, from the prosper perspective that uh, I was a singer uh, songwriter and uh, you know I was doing whatever Paul Simon was doing except Paul Simon had a record deal and everybody knew him and uh, I was just uh, unknown and uh, just making everything that had to happen happen myself. I was my own booking agent. I was my own roadie. I was my own lawyer. I was my own doctor. 
you know, stuff like that. How how far out were you touring? How far out were you getting out with your van? Well, um, I would go from Billings, where I my mom and I were at that time. I would go to Seattle. I would go to Denver. I would go to Missoula, Great Falls, Helena, Bozeman, Butte. Uh, I would go to those places, you know, mostly in that northwest area. Mm -hmm. And did, and did you record any? I started recording in... Uh, 76, 77, you know, um, and in 77 or 78, I did an album in Denver with a guy named Dick Darnell on uh, a label out of Seattle called First American Records, and, um, but, um, it was just a small time venture. It sure as hell didn't make me any money, but got laid a few times. Well, uh, uh, that's interesting. Um, I see that there is a, um, a record called Glenn Yarborough, Just a Little Love, First American Records. And it's got you. Yeah. As, it's got you as a composer. You wrote for this person. Is that right on that label? I did. Glenn Yarbrough was a, a guy that I met in Denver, and that um, he lived in Estes Park, I think, and he was friends with Dick Darnell, and um, so. Um, we became acquainted, and he did about three or four of my songs, two or three, I don't know. But he was primarily known as a folk singer in the early 60s with um, the Highwaymen, I think. Um, he was a hootenanny guy. He, uh, Baby the Rain Must Fall was his big claim to fame. I mean, back in those days, in the 60s, when, um, and he had, you know, he, women loved him. He was a short kind of and portly, you know. But, you know, he had it going on, man. He was driving the women crazy uh, all over. <laughs> well, I see that you had a song, you had a record called Costas on First American. Yeah. That, that was released in 1980, and it's under the genre heading of folk, world, and country. Which is pretty cool that it's um, uh, those in, you know world music and folk and country all combined. That's pretty cool. Well, yeah, and it's uh, the the production on those songs. That was my very first, uh, you know, aside from 66 when I went in the studio with Chan Romero, this was my first attempt at recording, and I hooked up with Dick Darnell, and he produced the thing, and in my opinion, at this point in time, or even back when I, the record came out, it was produced in a way that really didn't reflect who I was, you know, he was he was putting this ethereal jazz on and spin on what I was doing, you know. And and that wasn't exactly what in other words, he took control and tried to make and he did, he made the music um what based on what he wanted as opposed to what it was just coming out of me. And I didn't know the difference, so I just went along with it and once I realized you know it was it was just a learning experience basically but the songs that were on that record were I can see where people would think that they're world kind of music you know um, they're pretty uh, um, the, the songs were just 
leaning in a totally different direction back there. Yeah. You know? Well, the ti- different times. Mm-hmm. And would you, would you say that you had not found your voice yet? You were still finding your voice as a writer? I'm still looking for it. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you, you've told me before about a writer's career as a circle, and you, you explain, and I, we're going to talk about that later, but were you still figuring out who Costas was? I mean, even if you're... Uh, yes, you were. basically. And the reason uh, that was is because um, I didn't have anyone around me back there that uh, could um, create around me that which needed to be created in order to have a product, you know, that, uh, that had a sound around it, you know, like, it, other songwriters, singers, songwriters of that time period had uh, a label, they had management, they had uh, musicians, they had money, they had, um, they were part of that highest circle that, um, that the world had. I was, I had the talent back there, um, but I didn't have the um, machinery around me to promote myself in 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 a ref, in a creative way. Um, when people did believe in me, you know, they. Um, it was on a one-to-one basis in the clubs that I would play at, the, the people listening would hear that there was something there, but it was in a very um, raw form because I was just beginning. I was probably 25, 26 at the time. You know, I'm just coming out of uh, all that stuff that, you know, teenager and, or, you know, early 20s, that sort of world. I, I didn't have anything around me. I had to create uh, my own machinery and keep it going myself, you know. Yeah. Uh, you, in this business, you have to have management. You have to have uh, a great band, and you have to have a, you know, a good producer, good studios. You have to have people around you who can create that raw material that is you into, you know, something that the world will um, go out and buy. You know, I didn't have any of that. So during this time of the 70s into the early 80s, did you ever have a regular job or were you always doing, were you able to do, make it on music? Um, I've been making it on music since 1967. Yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, so what about, so after this record, what's the... The early to mid eighties, like. Well, as uh, you know, as you go through the years, you end up getting married. You end up getting divorced. Uh, you end up, you know, falling in love and all that stuff. Um. um it was uh, it was hard it was uh, when I got into the 80s um, you know I, I was uh, I got married in 78 or 77 somewhere in there and, oh. and I was divorced by uh, 
79 or 80. Okay, I didn't I didn't know that. We've never talked about that. Was she from, oh, was she from Billings? No, she was from Livingston. Okay. Yeah. And uh, she's still my good friend today, you know. That's cool. Yeah. And um, so I was just kind of in a uh, funk because uh, the effects of love are long lasting. Yeah, they are. And uh, they go with you and they cloud your thinking and uh, they color your world. You know, that blue funk colors your world. You look at the world through that lens and that echo of love stays in you a long, long time. And uh, so, I mean, I was going through a lot. I lost my dad in 67, and mom and dad got, you know, they divorced. Uh, um, you know, I saw the heartbreak in my mom. You know, I was trying to take care of her through the 60s and 70s to be a, a support to her, you know. And that's why one of the reasons why I stuck around Montana as opposed to leaving for L.A. Yeah. And uh, because I was an only child, you know, she was uh, she relied on me um, on a daily basis, you know. So um, in any case, um, it was all just kind of a difficult time the I mean along with the good times the, the, the veins of goodness that were in that um, that thing that I was going through there were also the blues that came along with it and so um, another thing that, that affected me in the 70s and early 80s was uh, uh, an experience with acid LSD back in 68 or 69 that also left a scar inside of me because one acid trip I took, um, you know, we were the first kids <laughs> in the state back then to be getting stoned and to taking trips and shit like that. You know, you're 18, 19 years old and uh, you're experimenting with psychedelics and you have no idea what you're going into. So if you take the wrong direction and you have no one there to uh, talk you back into the real world, you just keep drifting. Well, uh, I'm not, I found out later that I wasn't the only one that had a bad acid trip, but mine left me scarred for a long time. Like in what way? Uh, well, I thought I was dying of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And so the fear of it fed uh, my adrenaline. The adrenaline released itself through me, and it just kept... It was a vicious circle that fed on itself, much like fire blowing, sucking air out of the atmosphere to make itself grow, you know. And it took a long, long time to get over that uh, uh, that hole that I fell into back in the 60s. But I am, you know, I'm, since then, you know, I'm... I'm not doing acid, but I'm you know, <laughs> still snorting coke and weed. Uh, still happens, you know. I'm just joking, but uh, it was all part of the learning situation. A lot of times, I have this saying: the "Saying is, um, you don't know where you are till you've been there." Mm -hmm. You know, and so. Um, and, and I was uh, my own teacher. 
I didn't have anybody else uh, around me that um, could, you know, talk you uh, into seeing things. But in due time, um, the world came through my friends, the world of my friends um, supported me uh, and gave me the nourishment my soul needed to uh, just end up, you know, continuing through this journey, that's all. Well, talking about support, and you touched on your mom, you being all your mom had. Yeah. Talk to me about her support and y'all's relationship, because one thing that I remember clearly about Calliope and all the time we spent together when I was with her without you she was you know crazy crazy proud of you and uh, I mean in a real genuine uh, it's hard to hard to put into words uh, her the, the pride she had in you you know um, yeah. and uh Talk to me about because and y'all had a strong, strong bond. But I, I was just wondering if you would talk to me about how she supported you and y'all's relationship and yeah, all that. Well, I'm thinking that in the case of my mom, um, she, you know, had you know how women are with their children and fathers are the same way you know uh, they spend spend their entire lives um, supporting protecting um, uh, nurturing and caring for their children uh, in the case of my mom she only had me she came from a uh, a destitute country in, in uh, was born in the early 30s, came, uh, in, you know, born into a poor family, into a nation that had been ravaged by war after war, that had no future in it, um, except, you know, later in the 50s and the 60s, it started coming out and being able to support its population, meaning the whole nation. But, uh, so she came from uh, nothing. Uh, she cared and protected me as much as she could in life. And uh, the person she had to protect me from was my father, primarily. Um, you know, kids are, are they, they aren't born perfect, except that we love them perfectly, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but the flower is in the seed. And uh, so the parents, or my mom in this case, did everything she did in life, you know, to... Um, to make life easier for me. So I, I appreciated her and still do in my uh, memories of her. Um, but she, she had a right to, 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 to love and be proud of me, you know, because, you know, she, um, I was all she had, you know. She had no husband. She had one son. Uh, she lost her daughter when the baby was born back in 52. Um, you know, her husband abandoned her um, and left her alone with uh, debt and bills. Um, and so my father and I talked about it before he died and I know that uh, in his heart, he regretted uh, the things that he ended up doing. But uh, now when I think about our parents, I have to say that 
just as I'm not perfect in this world today, you know, because I, I'm the old one now. I'm the only one left. And, you know, our parents uh, pass away along, you know, our lives. They, they, and, and when they leave, they leave us orphans, you know. Um, so I know that my father's life, the world that he was born into, the world that he had to go through on his journey, uh, was had to be heartbreaking for him as well. So I forgave my dad. I for you know I forgive pretty much everybody because that's the only way I can forgive myself for some of the things I've done. Um, because none of us, you know, knows what we're doing in this world, and we only uh, can function in a loving way because of the love that is in the world, the love of the other humans around us, you know. So um, that is our guidance. And that love ultimately comes from God, you know. God must love mankind. As Randy Newman, in his song, that's why I love mankind, because he needs me, you know. So, yeah. Um, did, she, did she know that it was unusual, the path you had taken, Costas, say, in the 70s and 80s? Well, she knew that I was a musician back <laughs> from the very beginning, because, you know... Uh, she saw that evidence on a daily basis. She saw how much I was attracted to music every day I grew up, you know, under her care. And my dad knew it too. Um, the only thing is they never had the... Um, they didn't know that it existed. They didn't think that I was going to become, you know, uh, something out of my music. Something would come of it, you know. So when it did come, you know, it uh, it all of a sudden was this little seed that was planted that, you know, for the longest time didn't have a flower and one day all of a sudden there was a flower there and and everybody who saw or heard that flower saw something that they may have enjoyed and in any case um, I'm just trying to be humble here about who I am but I also can see why my mom is proud, you know, and my dad was too, and all my relatives, you know, and all my friends feel the same way, you know, yeah. I guess. But your, your mom's pride was uh, way deeper than success in the music uh, business, I can say that, um, yeah. just on a personal yeah. note. Uh, yeah. Um, so... Was it the mid-80s when things started? Is that when you connected to Nashville? Well, so remember I, I was in the 70s. I started traveling around from Billings. Uh -huh. sometimes, sometimes I was in, I had my own little groups. Uh, sometimes I was doing solo. Sometimes I was doing both, you know, depending on what the gig could afford to pay. Um, so, uh, on one particular occasion in the late seventies, I think I was playing with my band, uh, down in Jackson Hole at, at the Mangy Moose, I think, and in Teton Village, and uh, on Monday nights, um, we would get together over at the Snow King Inn at the Ramada, which was uh, the hotel downtown there, 
And everybody had Monday nights off. All the bars in town uh, took Monday nights off for music. And so all the musicians would gather at an open mic at the Snow King Inn. And uh, I think uh, Claire Lynch was playing uh, at the Ramada at that time with her band, the Front Porch String Band, and Claire was from Huntsville. She and her husband and uh, the rest of the band players, a bass player and a banjo player, and her husband played the mandolin, and she played guitar and sang, and they had a wonderful little bluegrass band. Well, I'd never heard bluegrass music prior to that Monday night in my entire life. I heard country music, I heard folk music, I heard um, rock music, you know, uh, but I never heard authentic uh, bluegrass. So, I, I mean, I, I was just, and she had such a wonderful, and still does, a wonderful voice. So, um, we just, she, you know, dug what she heard out of me, and I, that night, we got up to a jam at the open mic, and I dug what I heard in her and her little group as well. So, after the bar shut down, we all ended up in one of the motel rooms playing music till 3, 4, 5 in the morning. And, uh, and then that's when she and I exchanged our information. After their gig was done in Jackson, they went back to uh, Alabama, and I went back to Montana, but we kept in touch. Claire and her group uh, took with them three or four songs of mine she ended up was went to roanoke virginia and was recording an album that was being financed by three or four lawyers from the south there i'm not sure where they were from but um so claire asked me if i would come down to the uh to roanoke at the studio there and be a part of their recording so i joined in with them they flew me down i uh, they did three or four of my songs on an album that they were working on over there so this would have been in 79 when you recorded when did you meet her 78 or 79 yes okay yeah so uh, after we met a month or two after they flew me down to Roanoke where I participated with them to record whatever songs I was on with them, singing or playing a little guitar. Um, and they recorded three or four of my songs on that particular album. Well, the album that they were working on went nowhere because the partnership that put the money up dissolved and they didn't have the money to keep going with the record. So they ended up with either uh, it was a, a record, but they didn't have the means by which to put it out, you know, locally, wherever they were at. So um, Claire for the next 10 years, say from 79 through 89, she and I kept in touch. We were friends at, throughout that time period, and we would talk to each other a couple of times a year, um, kept in touch, and somewhere in 89 or so, I got a phone call from her in 88 or 89, and she uh, said in that wonderful, laughing, gentle, sweet voice of hers um, that there was a fellow named Tony Brown in Nashville and that uh, he heard my songs that she had recorded back then 
and that uh, he wanted to hear more of my songs and, and would like to communicate with me and would I object to any of that. So I told her to, I would that I would send her a dime that he she was to give that dime to him and that he could call me collect. <laughs> you know, because by the time 88 or 89 came along, you know, I was, you know, looking at the prospect of a dead-end life, you know, because I didn't have, you know, I never left for L.A. back in the 60s. I didn't know that Nashville existed as far as me uh, going to Nashville to be a songwriter or anything else. It, that just wasn't part of my thinking. I mean, it, not until it came to me did it become uh, a reality that, or a mirror I could look into and see something back. Uh an image there, you know, uh, some kind of future, some kind of a place that would want me, you know. So um, when she called and told me about Tony, I, I was all for it. So a couple of weeks go by and Tony Brown calls me and introduces himself to me and, and, uh, and then uh, he asked me if I wanted uh, to come down to Nashville and, and, and meet him and, and see what there was to do. Well, I think initially Tony Brown, uh, by that time, was also aware of that album that I had recorded because he was investigating me as much as he could to find out what there was out there of mine and in the 80s, I had that one album out from First American Records. Plus, I also had a um, number of songs that I went and recorded of mine uh, locally, either in Denver or Seattle or Billings, uh, in little studios. And I would, um, I sent him all the stuff that I had before I went down there while we were still talking over the phone long distance. So he became aware of what I was doing. And I think that for a while, I think he wanted to see if uh, I would be artist material for as well, because he was signing a lot of people. Well, I guess... After I, he flew me down there, uh, I don't know what happened to the artist, you know, uh, situation, but I ended up getting a writing deal nonetheless. And, and, Tony, uh, and Tony didn't have his hands in the pub, de in the writing pub deal? Uh, as far as I know, people have told me uh, in the past, while I was down in Nashville back in the 90s, that they thought that Tony was somehow or another involved in that situation. I don't think he was. Tony was, when I first got there, when I flew down to meet him initially, he and his wife, Gina, she, uh, they just got married and they were living somewhere outside of Franklin or something. And uh, I stayed with them for about a week at their house. And he went about introducing me to various different people, none of which I'd known prior to, and none of which I can remember who I met. I what, don't. What year would that have been? It would have been in 88 or 89, the okay. summer of. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so I, I'm down there with him. And he introduced me to one company. It might have been Warner Chapel. I don't know. And then after a day or two I, of what I thought I would be signing a deal with that company, um, there was some kind of a change of heart in Tony. Uh, maybe he had a better offer for me from um, Welk Music. 
in any case, um, next thing you know, I'm meeting with Dean K from Welk Music. Uh, and Dean ran the publishing company for Lawrence Welk. Uh, Dean is still alive, and Dean um, writes a newsletter for music um and for songwriters, I'll connect you to that uh, so you can see what he's all about. Yeah. Um, in any case, Dean um, signed me to Welk through, and at that time, Bob Kirsch was at the helm. Um, the other people that were working at Welk at that time were... Um, Bob Kirsch. Um, Doug Howard? No, Doug came soon after. Daniel Hill soon came soon after. Billy Lynn was there. Uh, Doyle Brown was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Millie Cantinelli was there. She was, uh, she did all the publishing and writing up of you know all the songs that were coming in on a daily basis the uh people writing at Wilk were bob mcdill uh, uh, who else i mean there was just a, a shitload of country and western songwriters um and over there and they all just kind of welcomed me into the fold um, and I, I got to know them I wrote with some of them um, I wrote um, I, I I didn't know because once you're successful over there once people see your your star is you know crossing um the night sky and lighting it up they want to write with you you know sure and you don't you can't write with everybody um so i wrote with the people that i became friends with that were friends in my circle of people and the people i, I first became associated with in Nashville, as my friends were Kathy Leuven, Pamela Hayes, Marty Stewart, uh, Pooh Bah, Don Mealer, Bobby Boyd, um, Jody Mathis, um, you know, and, and so I hung out with them, and they, of course, wanted to write with me, and I wrote with a bunch of them, made a bunch of them <clears throat> a lot of money. I was going to say you wrote a lot by yourself. And I wrote a lot by myself. Which is an unusual, that, that's not a, the norm in Nashville anymore, and I don't know how normal it even was then. Um, that's why in 1990 I was Songwriter of the Year, you know, from uh, NSAI. Well, you know, I just got there. And all of a sudden, you know, one day I'm with Ralph Murphy and we're down at this little um, bar. And of course, back in those days, bars would change. And that same bar would change hands and, and become another bar, you know. Um, so I, I was down there uh, for a place called Jamaica's. Yeah. Used to be. Yeah. Well, before it was Jamaica's, uh, it was something else. And that's when I, me and Ralph were in there. And we were the house bartenders that night. And uh, I was, I would be going to Nashville for about a month to two or three months at a time, depending on what the season was. And I would stay at Shoney's. And uh, I would uh, write songs, keep my appointments. You know, they kept me busy over there at Wealth Music. Um, I was having lots of success with my tunes. And um, so 
it was in 89 or 90 then that day that I was bartending with Ralph Murphy at this place down there that I met a couple of gals that worked for a publisher and uh, he introduced me, Ralph did, to these gals and we had, you know, we were all just talking and stuff and, uh, and the subject of me going back to Montana came up, so it must have been in August or September. And I told him that I'd be heading back to Montana in the next couple of days because, you know, it was the end of that um, trip. And they said, you can't go. And I said, why not? And they said, because you can't go. And I didn't think anything more of it. I just thought that they were just talking crazy for some reason or another. Well, the next day, uh, Bob Kirsch calls me in and says, yeah, he says, we're going to have to change your um, itinerary because you're going to have to stay here. And I asked him why, and he says, well, he says, because you're going to be the songwriter of the year, I guess. And I thought, <laughs> fuck, what does that mean? You know, I mean, why me? I mean, I just got here. Nobody knows who I am. You know, I wasn't aware of how these things happened. Well, it was it happened on the basis of the songs that I had written by myself, which were Timber I'm Falling in Love, The Lonely Side of Love, which was also a big hit for Patty Loveless. And um, then the work that I did, the songs that I wrote with Marty Stewart on his album, and... Uh, Um, so, so yeah, it, it calculates up when you're a solo writer. You yeah, have, you have a lot more uh, uh, percentages than somebody that's co-writers or three-way writers. Well, yeah. well, I didn't know anything to that effect. So, uh, I, I, I had no idea. Well, I mean. My God, you've got all these other great songwriters in this country and western town. This kid just gets off the fucking plane, and all of a sudden I'm songwriter of the year. Are you kidding me? Anyway. So well, uh, let me ask you this, because it did seem to happen fast as far as the Nashville thing. Of course, you were working on your craft for years and years before. What was it like? like what was going through your mind as you're hanging with Tony and meeting these people and being in record companies or publishing companies like you never had before, what was all that like to you? It was like being in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. You know, this kid that never had to afford to buy a candy bar suddenly <laughs> was eating lots of candy. Yeah. I was playing fucking guitars. <laughs> I was riding around. I was, you know, shit, it just, you know, the emperor's new clothes, man. I was strutting around, having fun, though. I, uh, you know, I never tried to piss anybody off or anything, never put anybody down or tried to, you know, I was always aware of where I came from and, and who I was, you know, but um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Was it uh, overwhelming at first? I mean, before you even got money, like just coming in here and having to negotiate a deal, and I'm sure you had to get a lawyer and had to, was all that just kind of uh, hard to believe and overwhelming? Yeah, and I didn't know the game. Everything that I had to do, I turned over to uh, attorneys, you know, and they they signed you up to the regular publishing deal, you know, where the publisher, I mean, Craig Hayes was my first attorney, and uh, the deal that I got from Welk in the beginning was they got everything in the publishing realm. Uh, I got a pretty good advance, you know, I think I was getting... 2500 bucks a month um, 
or something to that effect. I didn't know that I had to pay everything back. Plus, you know, they get all the publishing during that time period and they controlled everything. I mean, in spite of the one-sided effect of signing up with a publisher back then, it was still a great journey. Sure. It was a great time, you know, because once uh, the money starts coming in and the lights come on and and you're on Ralph Emery and, and you go on there on the set and you're wearing cutoffs and smoking a cigar and he's looking at you like you're fucking Martian. <laughs> You know, and Crook and Chase and all the rest of the, the Nashville, you know, shows that were on back there that, you know, you got to highlight. No, it was, it was, it was overwhelming. It was, it freed me inside to where I actually um, was walking in the clouds, you know, and that's not to say that um, I was being vain. No, I was uh, charmed. You were doing, I, you were doing what you were meant to do. Man, I was enjoying life, you know, and uh, the life that I never knew, that I didn't know was there, that, that possibility to... to ring that bell and get the cigar and all that shit and, you know I, there I was I was doing it you know and um, you know I was getting awards from BMI and, and shit like that you know and uh, and write ups and blah 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 and it was pretty amazing and uh, you know it's, it's amazing to me to see how Timber I'm Falling in Love was released at the end of May 1989. And you got here like in, did did you get here in 88, I guess? or Yeah, it was just a and couple of, it was not more than three or four months before it came out that I signed my deal. Wow. That's unbelievable. No kid, and uh, I didn't go to Nashville. Nashville came to me. Yeah. Did you realize yeah. that was rare at the time? When it no, happened? I had no idea of what the what that ride was all about. You know, uh, I'd never been successful at anything. You know, I was always the ugly duckling, you know, and uh, all of a sudden to, you know, be celebrated for what I always was in my life, you know, uh, seemed unique to me and uh, still does, actually. So tell me this, uh, things happen fast and you've, already, you've mentioned Marty. And the reason why I want to start with him is it seems to me that you guys were kindred spirits in, in, in your love of similar musical styles. And uh, he, he was more from bluegrass than you, but in country music and rock and roll. And then also in, in the love of old things as far as... Um, Artifacts, I guess, would be a way to put it, or antiques. Mm -hmm. how, mm -hmm. did, how did you and Marty meet? Well, um, in about 88 or 89, when I got there, um, I was seeing Tony a lot every day, you know, that I went to work when I, I would go down to Nashville. I'd see him, I'd stop in at the office. His secretary was Renee Bell. And uh, his office was across the street, I think. At that time, MCA was just across the street from the Welk building, um, not next door of where it was for a long time. Um, in any case, um, 
a lot of people were approaching Tony Brown and because they wanted something from him that he could give them. And one of the things that they wanted from Tony Brown people, young artists, was a deal. Tony, or uh, um, Marty had just been dropped by Columbia or CBS, I'm not sure which, uh, who he was with. And uh, at that time, we were all younger, you know. This was 30 or 40 years ago going on, 30. Um, and Marty saw in himself a future. He had married Cindy Cash. She was part of the Cash family. Uh, uh, and he was, you know, but he wasn't well received in, in his musical career. He hadn't had that breakthrough hit or anything to that effect. But he wanted a new deal with somebody and uh, his choice, or at least uh, the only choice that I was aware of that I knew about was uh, he wanted to sign or to go over to MCA with with uh, being a part of uh, Tony Brown's stable. So Tony says to Marty, he says, "All right," he says, "I want you to go up to Montana." and write with this guy, Costas. Come back and show me what you guys have written, and then we'll see what to do from there. He did that not only with Marty Stewart, but he did it with Raul. He did it with James House. Uh, Kevin Welch came up here. Uh, a bunch of different guys came up here to write with me. And... Uh, and stuff to that effect, you know, but it worked in the case of uh, some of them and it didn't work in the case of others, you know, but the Mavericks and Marty Stewart and whoever else, McBride and the Ride, Terry McBride came up here and we wrote, uh, uh, I can't stand the you going out of my head or mind or whatever it was. So anyway, I ended up uh, meeting Marty through Tony Brown. Marty came up here and hung out with me for about two weeks. We wrote a bunch of these songs, Don't Leave Her Lonely Too Long, and... Uh, um, Half a Heart? Yeah. And those kind of things, and and then we wrote, you know, probably somewhere around twenty or so songs. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them got recorded. One got picked up by Buck Owens on Buck's last Capitol album. Really? Which one was that? It's called Twice the Speed of Love. How sweet is that, man? I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. That was a thrill, and, huh? Yeah, yeah, it was a metal you can pin on your chest there, you know. Uh, the other song was uh, a song that Joy Lynn White did called True Confessions. Yep. And uh, she was a spunky little girl, man. I really uh, like that record a lot, actually. Yeah, she was a good little, she, just a wonderful singer, a good girl. You had another one by her called It's About Me you wrote with John Bettis. I, yeah, I guess. I don't remember that one, but okay. Hmm. And you know, another one you and Marty did was uh, I Want a Woman. I always liked that. Mm -hmm. I, was a yeah. kid, I was a kid listening to this stuff in Arkansas and in California uh -huh. uh, before I came here. Um, let me ask you this. Uh... You and Marty, you and Marty connected. Did you guys connect on old things as well as music, like antiques and artifacts and whatnot? 
Was that both going on with both of you guys already back then? Yeah. Now, when Marty came up here to write with me that summer, uh, we were going through all these albums, and uh, I had this Rose Maddox and the Maddox Brothers album, and we were looking at it and talking about the music and all that shit, and uh, they were all, the band, uh, they were all dressed up, and they all wore the same uniforms and everything. Well, I think I told Marty uh, he ought to go find these people and see what they got in their closets. Well, next thing you know, Marty bought Hank Williams's collection, Rose Maddox's collection. Out of Rose Maddox's collection, he gave me one of her dresses. Uh, I thanked him and tried it on, and of course it's too small, but you know, it was nice of him to... <laughs> Shit. It's true, though. Uh, somewhere in this building, there's a dress of hers. But uh, he went on a rampage he went uh, down and got whatever clothes that he could and guitars and stuff. He was into buying, swapping, mostly swapping. You know, he ended up, um, he had a guitar that uh, Joe, or no, Merle, uh, uh, who was that guitar player that wrote Nine Pound Hammer? And, Merle uh, Travis? Yeah. Uh, Travis, uh, what was his name? Merle Travis? Merle Travis, yeah. Wow, he had that Bigsby, that was a Bigsby guitar, was it? I don't know if it was a, it might have been a Bigsby guitar, but he traded Johnny Cash because he was, a member of the family, he was married to Cindy Cash. So he, and he was also in Cash's band for a long time. And prior to that, he was with Earl Scruggs. And also, I mean, he was a child prodigy and got to know all those old timers. Somehow or another, he had this guitar that Johnny Cash wanted. So he traded the guitar that he had of Merle Travis's for Johnny Cash's D-45 that uh, Hank Williams uh, had that Audrey gave Hank on his birthday, one of his last oh. birthdays. She bought a guitar for him. How did Johnny get it, do you know? Uh, it was given to him by Audrey after... Um, after Hank died. Wow. So uh, they traded. Of course, neither of them knew what they were doing. Uh, that guitar, that D45 uh, that of Hank's is probably worth a half a million dollars by itself, you yeah, know? Sure, absolutely. And... Uh, the Merle Travis guitar might be worth seventy five, eighty five thousand. I don't know. Maybe uh, I don't know exactly which guitar it was, but in any case, um, they traded, and uh, Marty was into old guitars and and band suits and. And so he started buying collections of this stuff. And I think, uh, you know, part of me rubbed off on him. Part of him rubbed off on me, you know, as far as uh, we both had that bug of collecting, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I can't say for sure, but, you know. Did he already have the Clarence White guitar when you guys met? He got it soon after. I think he went because 
the one thing that did happen after he got his writing deal, or not his writing deal, but his record deal with MCA, uh, after he came back from Montana back to Tennessee, he got his deal with Tony Brown. Tony produced uh, one, maybe two albums uh, of Marty's on with, MCA Records, and then... With Richard Bennett uh, kind of overseeing it? Bennett? Yeah, Richard Bennett. Yeah, I think he was involved, too, yeah. as co-producer or something. And uh, on the second album, uh, Marty went and wrote with Paul Kennerly. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that, that's when Hillbilly Rock and Little Things, uh, those were his biggest songs to you, date. You always told me you thought Marty had a good magic with Kennerly. With who? You, told, you had told me years ago you thought Marty had a good magic with Kennerly. Oh, absolutely. They, uh, uh, they connected, um, you know, on a, in, in a wonderful way, I think, yeah. So, then let me ask you, just, I just want to ask you about certain people. So, the next guy I was thinking to ask you about was Dwight Yoakam, how you met him. Because that would have been early on too, and the reason why I know that is is that um, I remember being a gosh, I think I was nineteen when if there was a way came out, and I remember getting that CD at like Walmart or something and putting it on, you know, written just really uh, as a fan at that age of Dwight it seemed like things had stepped up a notch from his other records when if there was a way. I, I, I guess, I, I guess and right before that was Buenos Noches, and those two records seemed to take on a higher level than the first two records. But how did you meet Dwight? Well, um, I think by the time... 91, 92, 93 rolled around, I was pretty much on a major roll with what I was writing and it being picked up uh, by all sorts of people. So um, I was, uh, I had this idea for turn it on, turn it up, turn me loose. And I, uh, one of the guys that was in our office that wanted to write with me, and I forgot his name right now, but... Waylon Patton? Waylon, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, he wanted, and it was our first time to get together and write, and only time. Um, so I said, sure, let's write something. And I'd, I always presented these fellas and gals with an idea that I had. And... Uh, the idea I had was turn it on, turn it up, turn me loose, you know. And I had the melody going, and we worked on it for maybe about two weeks, three weeks. We got it done, whatever it was. Uh, he was a good sounding board, you know. Um, we have to think uh, about words and stuff, you know. I like to write fast when I write, you know, but he slowed me down and 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 uh we got our song done and so um then it got turned in um and either billy lynn or daniel hill uh they knew who was looking for songs and what they were looking for so pete anderson was producing dwight and they were out of L.A., so my team, Billy or Daniel, ended up sending that song to Yoakum through Pete. Peter told me later that he had gotten over 400 songs pitched to him, and out of those 400 songs, he 
chose so my song uh, and another song, somebody else's song, so on. Anyway, um, they ended up going in the studio, and I think to date, um, my two favorite, uh, well, I can't say my two favorite of all, but if there was a top 10 or 20 list of uh, favorite renderings of what an artist who took your song ended up doing with it, Turn It On, Turn It Up, Turn Me Loose was such a fucking brilliant uh, production on the part of Pete Anderson and uh, and Yoakam. I mean, it was it was just stellar in my mind what they did, and then to come out with that video uh, that he that he has of it, that's like a, a mini movie. It's like some bizarre uh, little Twilight Zone half hour, you know, uh, worth of entertainment there. It was just cooler than shit. I just love it today i can watch it over again and over and over again and, and just enjoy what what yokum did with that video well, and, uh, and, it, and that happened earlier than you think that album was released in 1990 so that happened fast too as you go yeah through. well i can't keep track of sure. when all that shit was happening but let me yeah, ask you this did you speaking of the production uh, and that, that, that song really made an impression on me, like literally. In fact, Costas, the reason why that song, that album sticks in my head so much besides the fact that I was already a Dwight Yoakam fan and I was already, uh, and I loved the music on that record, that was my first CD. I remember I had to buy a little CD player to plug into my stereo and it was so I could listen to If There Was A Way, that album that came out in 1990. Because, uh, you know, if you think CDs were kind of, that was a new medium, you know. And I had seen them, but I hadn't bought any myself. I was still buying cassettes and uh, vinyl in the late 80s. So my question to you is, is, did you have that kind of Johnny Cash groove in mind when you wrote in production type thing? When mm -hmm. you wrote that? Absolutely. Well, I demoed it and sent it to him, and they pretty much took whatever my production was and then went in and enhanced it from there, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Would that be a correct assessment that it was kind of like Johnny Cash on steroids, the, the, the backing of that song? Yeah, uh, I would say... Johnny Cash and, and somebody else, too. I wouldn't know who. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say that um, it had a wonderful uh, retro uh, injection in it. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, as well as being current and modern. for the dance. Yeah. It was modern, too. Mm -hmm. So how did that lead? So he cut, turned it on, but you guys also co-wrote songs for that record. How did that all come about? And Tell me about that. Well, uh, I had gone, uh, after Pete produced uh, and had a hit with Turn It On, Turn It Up, Turn Me Loose, we became friends over the phone and uh, it was suggested uh, by either my company or uh, or Peter, you know, but I got the invitation to come to L.A. and to write with them over there. So I also did a tour, a musical tour out there. Um with uh, Liberty when I did that record, mm -hmm. that songwriter series. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, but I don't remember which came first. You I know? think this came first. The, the, song, the Liberty yeah. record came a little later. Uh -huh. um, and yeah. did you first start out writing with Pete and Dwight, or just you and Dwight? Uh, me and Dwight. And, and tell me about that, because uh, it's interesting to me, because you were a Nashville outsider that was accepted by Nashville, but still kind of on the fringes of, like your music was different from a lot of what was going on here. Yeah. And then Dwight yeah. was for sure an outsider. Mm -hmm. And how, how was it with you guys first getting together, and, and how did that all go down? Well, um, uh, whenever I hooked up with Yoakum, we went up to his house, and uh, and that's where we wrote was out of his uh, out of his house for about a week. Uh, we did that. Um, he. Um, a liking to what I was doing and what I was all about and uh, and I you know a lot of those songs like uh, um, Try Not to Look So Pretty and This Time and uh, uh, This Heart of Stone mm -hmm. uh, and whatever else a lot of those songs uh, ideas came out of him. He was, he started writing them at some point and couldn't get past a certain place on them. And, uh, so like on Try Not to Look So Pretty, uh, he had, um, the verse melodies and I came up with the chorus, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, there was this, you know, wonderful blending of what he was creating and how I adapted to his process and uh, and kept up to that level, you know, and took it even higher. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying, and the reason why I asked about how it went down is because I would think he would, he did, he has never seemed like the one that trusted the system or trusted anybody of you know, the Nashville thing, even, and even though you weren't, you came, even though you were coming out of Montana, you came to him by way of a Nashville company, but yeah. talking about your thing and his thing and taking it to a higher level, to me, the song, nothing really shows that because it's got this dark minor kind of moody verse and then this R and B chorus that, Reminds me a lot of you, a lot of your roots. Can you tell me about that song in particular? Yeah, well, the whole structure of the melody came out of me. Yeah. That was, uh, um, and we got together and I, I told Dwight, I said, now look, I've got this melody, but I just don't know how to uh, open it with any thoughts, any place to take it. So uh, after I showed him the melody and everything, then uh, if you listen to the lyric, there isn't very much to it. You know, it 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 says something, uh, and then he kind of does this resuscitation thing or whatever it's called uh, through it. Um, you couldn't change your heart. I, I couldn't change your mind. No, you know, he speaks it and then he sings it. And it stays the same. So there's like one verse and one chorus and it lasts for three minutes or so. But it was really cool. I thought it was uh, as far as country music went back to soul music, which would have been like guys like Joe Tex back in the early 70s, you know, mm -hmm. where, where there was country soul uh, uh, feelings. and uh, I, heard, uh, I heard Al Green in that. Of course, it might have been the production, yeah. you know. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as well as Al Green, you know. But uh, yeah, it was just uh, he surprised me with that because I thought I left it uh, when I left L.A. Uh, I left him with that song and whatever we had worked on. Uh, it, in my mind, it was still something that needed to be worked on. Mm-hmm. Well, when he went into the studio and uh, Pete produced the thing, they just took whatever we had written and made it work in the confines of the that that song, you know. Yeah, and it, and it worked just fine. It didn't become a hit song. Tony Brown pulled me in one day and he says, man, he says, I heard your new song with Yoakam. He says, it's a smash. (laughs) Well, it was not a smash. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Country radio just didn't open up to it. You you guys were definitely pushing the envelope compared compared to other artists and writers. And then I'll tell you another one that I just loved. I love the groove on and the Buck Owens type singing over the top of it was this time. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that one. That was one of his ideas. And he was, you know, it was his melody and he wrote the verses up till you got to the chorus once again and then he didn't have one. So the chorus is where I jumped in and then whatever lines in the last verse or throughout the song that I jumped in on. It's hard to remember what we did specifically, but I uh, worked primarily on the chorus and created that um, in this time. You know, something else I noticed about this era of Dwight uh, in his vocal turns when... Around this time, and then the album Nothing was on, he really started getting into these kind of Elvis type, kind of like 70s, early 70s Elvis type vocal turns. Whereas before he was doing more of the Hillbilly and Buck Bakersfield thing. Was that, uh-huh. did you guys ever talk about any, any of those influences while you were working? Uh, no, but I find. Uh, I thought about um, Yoakam's um, evolution as well. And uh, those songs that he did, um, like Little Sister and uh, uh, Suspicion. Did he do Suspicion? Suspicious Minds. Suspicious Minds, yeah. yeah. And those songs you know he did go back to Elvis and it worked and it worked wonderfully you know once again um, it was Yoakam's thinking and Pete's production and also the the music cats that he had around him in his band yes Uh, they were all savvy to what uh, was going on and it all worked brilliantly you know and you know really the the one that he hit it out of the park of uh, you know hit it out of the park the most on to me probably the the signature song of that era for him he didn't write with you that's ain't that lonely yet like that's a timeless career trademark song yeah. Can you tell yeah, me, that's, Can you tell I, me about writing that and him and getting that cut? Well, because that's a few years later from the. That's in '93, so it's a few years later from the "Turn Me, yeah. Turn Me, Turn It Up, Turn Me Loose" album. Now, during that time period when I wrote that song, I was writing a lot with James House and the reason I wrote a lot with him is because I like James yeah you know he was a friend of mine and uh but when we got together to write that song James did not write 
hardly anything in that song. It, it was pretty much what you heard came out of me. Um, and But James was lucky enough to be in the room when that song came out. And uh, I don't care if he likes it or not. That's just the way it is. That's what happened. Not just in that case, but in a lot of other songs with some of these other folks that I wrote with. You know, I wrote with them because they were friends of mine. And on a day when that song was coming out, I was writing with them. So they got half of it. But uh, I guarantee you the song came out of me. Well, that, that song is totally, um, had, that song has your footprint all over it. That I guess is the yeah. best way I can say it. That if there ever was a conscious song, not only melodically and groove-wise, but every time I hear the lyric, once there was a spider in my bed, I got, I got caught up in her web. That is such a Costas, like, uh, there's just no, I mean, it, that's you as a writer. You know what I mean? Like, I I know that's your, your DNA, if that makes sense. Well, um, yeah, I guess I, I know what you're saying, and, uh, it's hard to talk about these things without um, sounding or wanting, you know, I'm not trying to be vain in any way or shape or form, but at the same time, I just want to, I don't want to, uh, all I want to do is to show the, the, the place the song came from, who it came from, and, and you're right, that, like like you said and like I said, you know, that, that was, you know, one of those things. And the same applies to um, uh, Mandy Burnett, you know, um, and a song called Rainy Days. Mm -hmm. And another song that I wrote with uh, uh, Pamela Hayes, I wrote that one with Pamela, and I wrote uh, um, that Dixie Chick song, you know, um, I can love you better. Well, Pamela was with me those days. Everybody wanted to write with me because they knew that shit was coming out of me, and that's why they all hung around and wanted to do the sessions with me, you know? Sure. And, and so I just said, sure, let's, let's get together. So I'll see you Monday. I'll see you Tuesday. Well, Monday, Tuesday... This song was born, okay, it was born during a time when I was writing that day with this person or that person, but the songs were born yeah, in here, in this part, and uh, those other people, I'm glad for them because they, they got to buy a house. What about uh, the Mandy Barnett set, a song, That's All Right? Who'd you write that with? That's all right, that's all right. Oh, the night is tender and the night is strong. Yeah, let me think. That's all right with me. Tony Perez, that's who you wrote it with. Oh, my God, you talk about it. Yeah, that guy was, uh, he was working at Welk, too. And he, Kirsch wanted him to write with me. So Kirsch sent him up one winter, and uh, I wrote two or three or four songs with him. That boy was the lamest uh, songwriter I ever wrote with, but uh, he got lucky because he was, uh, he got half of that song and maybe another song, and I can't tell you what... Well, the other song was. Well, I asked about the That's All Right With Me because that also has a, it has your your stamp all over it, too. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's very obvious. So, well, that's the whole thing about co-writing is that it dilutes who you are because, and a lot of times it's good, but in the case of some people, it, it, it dilutes uh, who you are as a writer too because these songs were uh, 
arranged to be written. I mean, they came out of an arrangement with somebody I never knew before, you know. Uh, in the case of Tony Perez, you know, I just did it as a favor to Bob Kirsch to have him come up and write with me in Montana. Um, but, uh, and then he disappeared, but in the process, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, he got to, you know, he got half of the writer's royalties anyway. Whatever, I don't care. Well, one thing I can say about, and you said it, that you and Yoakum lifted each other, you know, as far as it's obvious that both sides were pulling their weight, I think, in that songwriting collab collaboration. Collab yeah. I think so, too. And, I and I, I also think, whereas, let me just say that I love Marty Stewart as an artist and as a as a as a person, but I don't I don't put him in the same ballpark as you or Yoakum as a songwriter. That's just my personal taste. Mm -hmm. But and also I don't put Raul in that same category. But I will say that you and and he styles on one song in particular seem to really. I mean, like. You guys just knocked it out of the park with what a crying shame. Like that mm -hmm. like I hear both influences and I think I do anyway, I hear both of you in there. Can you talk about y'all's relationship and that particular song? Yeah, well, once again Tony Brown was instrumental in that uh collaboration and uh Tony was thinking of signing Raul, and Raul and his band were out of Miami. Uh, so he introduced me to Raul in Nashville one summer, uh, back at that same time period. And he told Raul to come up here and write with me. So Raul came up uh, and flew up here for a couple, a couple of weeks, um, and for that time period, I wrote um, a dozen songs with him. I don't know what we wrote, but uh, Cry and Shame was one of them. Here Comes the Rain is another one. Um, oh, that's a great one, too, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so anyway... Um, I I loved Raul, um, and I uh, think he's a great singer, but uh, he's not a great songwriter. The melodies and most of the words to most of the songs we wrote, um, I think, you know, at this point it ain't going to matter, but... Um, it was a good collaboration. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, different relationships bring different things to songs and days. You know what I mean? Um, like, um, uh, the, but the, the thing with, the thing about, you mentioned, uh, Turn It On with, with Yoakum had this retro cool thing, but yet was still modern. And I think the same thing with What a Cry and Shame. You've got this kind of Orban-esque kind of soaring chorus and, and this kind of uh, Jeff Lynn kind of track, you know, And but it was very modern, and uh, there, it had a lot going on to it, I think. Well, I do too, and I think that in, in, a, in a way, back in the 90s, what I brought to the table to Nashville was um, the retro musical sense that had been forgotten. And most everybody in Nashville was writing these three chord uh, songs like, you know, uh, the same three chords uh, E, A, and B, E, A, and B, you know, kind of uh, almost 
you know, it, it, there had to be more to to music than than E A and B. You know, I think uh, uh, so much of what I loved in music that I consumed through my hearing the songs and the songwriters and the artists in the 50s and the 60s and in the 70s, you know, I brought that with me because to me it was vibrant, it was alive, and it made sense, you know, melodically. Um, so I was, <laughs> I've always enjoyed rock and roll, you know, sure. and I've always enjoyed people like uh, Steely Dan or um, uh, the Doobie Brothers or the Birds or Buffalo Springfield. Those people are important to me. And Paul Simon, and Randy Newman, Joni Mitchell, uh, Bob Dylan, you know, I don't care. They're all essential. And country music and country artists back then, as well as today, they seem to limit themselves to such a small part of what is out there, such a minuscule part. They have no imagination. Uh, and, you know, when I do hear a great song that, you know, which you've written uh, a, a number of, great songs uh you know i um i admire that i think the world needs uh to expand its uh the world of nashville needs to expand its frontiers and quit limiting itself to this same diatribe bullshit that uh was prevalent in the 90s and has worsened in the 2000s, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I think that that might be popular music as a whole, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and technology might have a lot to do with it. Uh, let me ask you this, though. Talking about pulling from your roots, uh, I have a fond memory of uh, I was back home in Arkansas and about 19 years old driving a truck delivering lumber and if I got to uh, use the pickup instead of a flatbed the pickup had an AM radio in it and I never will forget the first time I heard timber coming through that AM radio <laughs> and man it really spoke to me because um, I grew up with my mom's records as a kid. And so as a kid, I had 45s of people like Buddy Holly and the Beach Boys and, you know, these different Johnny Cash or Jan and Dean and Herman's Hermits all over the place, you know, the Beatles, uh -huh. all this stuff. But when I heard Timber, something resonated in me that, and you know, I'm 19, I'm a kid. But something about Timber's groove said to me, Buddy Holly. And I, and I don't know why, and I'm just curious. Was that just the way it kind of went down? Was there any influence there? Absolutely. The influence, um, not just Buddy, but the Everly Brothers. And it all goes back. Timber could have been a song that Boudelow and Felice wrote. Mm-hmm. The affinity between me and, uh, uh, what's his name, um, one of their sons that ran B a BMI. Um, Dale Bryant. Dale. We never got to see him that night, but he knew back in the old days, back in the 90s, uh, he and I became great friends because I told him flat out right, I says, your mom and dad were major influences on you know who i am and so uh and he saw that too and he 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 understood that's why we're great friends today you know mm -hmm. um so 
that particular song does have uh, an essence to it that would go back to a Buddy Holly, Everly Brothers kind of feel, and also Felice and Boodle yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this, like, because it's so interesting, you have all these influences and they turn up in your songs. And we've talked about how we've talked about some of these cooler influences like uh, Buddy Holly or, or the Everly's or Johnny Cash or uh, we spoke of Orbison. But then it's almost like a hard left turn to Lord have work mercy on the working man, which is this awesome working man's country. You know, it's, it's, I don't want to use the word square cause it's not square, but it's not, it's not the ultra cool of those others. It's more working class. Maybe that's the way I could say it. How did that song come about Costas? Well, uh, along with, Every other color in the rainbow, there was one that encompassed Hank Snow and uh, 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 Tennessee Ernie Ford, um, Merle Travis, uh, who, uh, Tennessee, not Tennessee Ernie Ford, but uh, Eve, I, I already mentioned his name, but... Um, he was essential. Um, there's two cats out there. Uh, who did uh, Blue Yodel number or whatever? Jim, Jimmy uh, Rogers. Jimmy Rogers. Yeah, I hear that influence. And also, who got Jimmy Rogers' guitar when he died? His wife gave it to Ernie Tubbs. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, all those people there would have done uh, a song like Lord Have Mercy on the Working Man as well as Merle Haggard. See, that's what I always thought it was a Haggard type song, but mm -hmm. I see where, I mean, Haggard got part of his thing from Jimmy Rogers. That mm -hmm. makes total sense, yeah. So, uh, uh, It's just so I, cool how different it is from those others we've talked about, you know? Well, once again, uh, what that is is country blues, and uh, uh, there's country blues uh, is what the black man was doing on the other side of the tracks. Uh, the country blues was done by the white man on the other side of the tracks. They were both dirt poor. And that song is all about being dirt poor and uh, and being the camel that everybody else is riding on, you know. Um, so I just, I came from a working man's uh, experience in my life. My father, my stepfather, uh, you know, my mother, all of my family, your family, everybody. We came from that side of reality. Yeah. And uh, so setting that feeling and those thoughts in a country blues format and that simplicity and bringing it back to that time period uh, made it new all over again. You know, um, do you have do you have any memories of writing that tune? You wrote that one by yourself. Yeah, well, that's just what I did. I wrote it here in Montana, uh, and I wrote it. I thought to myself one day, I need to write a song about the working man, and um, that's where it came from. You know. Guys that come home, you know, smelling like sweat and dust, you know, and are hungry and need a shower. 
you know, and then multiplied times six days a week, every week of their lives. So that was too was one that I was, you know, young and and still in Arkansas, but I, uh, of course, driving a truck would would relate to it, but. I love the line, while the rich man's busy dancing. Why is the rich man busy dancing while the poor man pays the rent? Bad. Mm-hmm. That's a great one. I, for some reason, when I was a kid, I always thought it was, why is the fat man busy dancing while the poor man pays the bed? <laughs> well, the thin man, that's what one of the lines in one of the verses was. But I think uh, Travis just kept it uh, rich and poor. But... Uh, and when I do it, it's why, why is the fat man busy dancing while the poor man or while the thin man pays the band? Yeah, well, so I, maybe I'm just remembering wrong. I heard you play it that way maybe then. Yeah. Um, My I, favorite line <laughs> in that song is, uh, Lord, they're billing me for killing me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, another line in there, though, that uh, uh, reminds me of you is, hey, St. Peter, look down for a minute and see this little man about to drown. Mm-hmm. That sounds like Costas talking, which I try, you know, I try to encourage my students and kids to write lyrics how they would talk, you know, and speak. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So then also I want to ask you just on these different musical styles, I kind of put life number nine and I can love you better than that in a similar vein. Can you talk about those songs a little bit and their influences? Um, life number nine. Yeah. Tina? That's the other song I wrote with that. Tony Perez. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Um, well, um, Having grown up consuming records, subconsciously, I think, we learn uh, the anatomy of a hit song. And uh, at least some of us do, and you're one of those kind of people. Um, So, life number nine... Uh, there's a I mean uh, who did that? Martina McBride yeah yeah she did Um, in any case uh, you take snippets of things that you remember having heard other people putting that uh, 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 kind of feel to it or uh, they, you know, and and you bring it back and and it connects to the song and um, and it just makes everything sparkle. Um, As to um, there's an element of groove to those two songs, um, as well as melody, that keep it flowing, uh, that make it interesting to the listener, and uh, make them want to go and buy the fucking record. You know, uh, and that's what you want music to do. You want it to. Um, if it's going to be a groove song, then make the thing groove. Well, it sounds uh, like those, the influences musically are more from your late 60s, early 70s rock influences. Would you agree? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I use the things that I learn in my musical vocabulary Uh, I've always done that. Uh, People have said, you know, there's something about your style of writing. 
I'm listening to it, and I say I'm om- I've almost heard that song before somewhere, but it doesn't really sound like any of the other songs, yet it reflects something that connects to another thing of the past. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's a big compliment, I think. Yeah, well, uh, as long as you don't blatantly rip somebody off, but to be able to regurgitate the past and put it into uh, something that is viable now, I think uh, using the past in that way is a tool. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, so a couple more folks I want to talk about one real quick you know a record I got turned on to I don't think until I got to town just because it wasn't it wasn't one of the big ones out there that I would have picked up on until I got around some people in the know but the Kelly Willis album that had it's such a great record and had baby take a piece of my heart you oh, wrote, yeah you wrote with her can you talk she's a great singer can you talk about your time with her, writing with her and that song? Sure. Um, I wrote three songs with her. And maybe maybe four. I don't know. Um, but in the case of... Uh, I think I wrote with her in Austin and then also in Nashville. I was in love with that little girl. You know, she didn't know it. I can see why. Yeah. Um, so I I brought out some wonderful ideas and uh, invited her to be a part of them. And that's about all I can tell you. And uh, Tony Brown did the rest of it along with Harry, you know. Yeah. Well, then the other person I wanted to talk about, which was, uh, an influence on you and then you guys had great success together was Harlan Howard. Oh, yeah. He's my best. How did you guys meet? And tell, tell me about y'all's relationship. Well, all right. Well, by the time I got to Nashville in 88 or 89, whatever it was, um, and soon after, I had my first number one song and there was a BMI party for my song Timber at BMI so uh, there I was you know just amazed that they're having a party for me at BMI you know uh, and and all these uh, country and western dignitaries were showing up to shake my hand and have their picture taken with me May Axton was another one that was there at that party, and I should have written with her, too, but I didn't. Um, but Harlan was there, and he said, uh, you know, uh, he was happy to meet me. Well, I, I knew who Harlan was because I've known Harlan since uh, uh, 1959 and 60, you know, um, from all the songs of his that were on the jukeboxes back home and throughout all the 60s from that time period forward. So I knew who he was, um, and it was a thrill to meet him because, you know, he was one of my heroes, you know, and he's still alive, and he came over to see me and to be at my party. So, you know... I asked him if he'd like to write with me sometime, and he said, yeah. So uh, that's how we got together to start writing. But here's what happens. The old songwriters, uh, which I am currently one of now, I wasn't when I first started, but I am now. When the, you know, when you live in Nashville like Harlan did, and Hank uh, um, Cochran. Cochran and uh, uh, Mel Tillis and whoever else from the old school, uh, those old cats, um, as they get older, they connect themselves to younger writers. And that's how they prolong 
their careers. Well, that's what Harlan was doing. He was networking. Of course, he may have liked the song, but he was also networking uh, back there to um, to still be uh, viable in his life, and, and it works. The old guys uh, meet the young guys that are up and coming, and uh, the young guys don't understand that the dynamics between their careers and this old guys are different. One is waxing, one is waning, mm -hmm. you know. But at the moment that you meet, you don't consider that, you don't see that. You just see your hero standing in front of you. So you reach out and make the connection. And then that connection turns into, you know, blossom in the various different songs that were written. So uh, with Harlan, everything that we did, I enjoyed doing, you know, because he was kindred spirit in my mind. Yeah. In my mind. Yeah. The, um, you know, it's interesting. I think that's, that's different now, though, uh, whereas, say, you and I came up in different eras, but it was the same for me when I met you. I was, um, you know, uh, nervous as I could be the first time you and I got together, and I was thrilled to, to get to, you know, and I didn't know anything about you, and... Um, but to, to get to be just to, you know, sit down with you was just so exciting. Um, and then to have connections like when we would ride around and go uh, uh, estate selling or go pick Sophie up at school or whatever we were doing, you know, it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun, those similar connections. But what I'm saying is, is I don't think now there is a as much a respect from from younger writers for the people that have come before them, or even an understanding of the music or the craft that those people have done. You know, like, and I think it's because we've had American Idol now for. 12, 13 years or 15 years. Um, it, it just seems to be a different um, uh, dynamic in the uh, in that world. I, I'm not quite sure if I'm expressing that right. No, you did. I think, you know, I think what the world today is missing is mentorship. And... Uh, It's almost as if the style that is um, currently in effect uh, doesn't recognize anything of the past. All that it knows is itself. And by doing just that, it limits itself to, uh, you know, nothing. If you want to know what nothing sounds like, turn on your radio. Yeah. If you want to know what nothing looks like, turn on your TV, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a different different world. It's interesting to me that before Haggard died, I, I read an interview where he was complaining about the lack of melody in songs today. This is a couple of uh -huh. years or now. But I would even say it's not just melody, but I think the use of the English language is uh, very limited to like almost uh, not not that I, I myself or any of the music I loved was ever you know Shakespeare or rocket science, but I just think that it's the songs have been limited to where's the party and I don't yeah. know it's, it's just a we, it seems that we're in a and you know a lot of those kids know that Costas uh, they you know and they they don't that's why a lot of them. I think they have a thing going on outside of radio that we don't even know about because they don't get anything they, you know, I'm not talking about necessarily country music here, but like some of the kids that dig deeper, they're just finding their own music on the internet, you know, uh, yeah. which doesn't pay the bills for songwriters, but anyway. Um, 
I want to absorb all this and come back to ask you some big picture questions, if that's okay. This is, sure. This sure. has been great to hear all of this, man. Well, um, Odie, <laughs> um, uh, there's two people in the room talking, and that's you and me, um, we're talking about this wonderful thing that we've experienced in our lives, and uh, it's important. It's important, um, not that I'm important or you're important, but the music is important, and because it's important and because we are parts of it, then that gives our lives some relevance, you know. And um, I'm so glad that you wanted to hear my story. Uh, I couldn't have enjoyed telling it to anybody more than I have visiting with you about it, that's all. Um, because... Your vision and your understanding of things um, is able to understand my experience. Um, it just, uh, it's that connection that makes us friends and kindred spirit and brothers, you know? Yep. Well, it's been a joy for me. And do you want me to send you copies of this, Costas? When the time comes, yeah. yeah. Okay, oh. cool. Well, yeah. I'm going to take some time and think about this because really what I, I, after getting to this point, I want to talk about um, the cycle you've talked about in songwriting and I just want to carry on through the 2000s and and then talk about young people and thought your thoughts about things you want to sh share, you would want to share, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, let's talk some more about it. Let's uh, let's see what there is left to say about it, and uh, and hopefully, um, I know in your hands it'll be a tool that uh, you can point to to the kids that you're reaching out to this year and every other year that you're going to be teaching, you know? Yeah. So, uh, and I think, like I said, I think that uh, before we disappear off the face of this earth, uh, let the echo of our words uh, be set in motion so that perhaps when we're gone, you know, uh, some seed will land in some piece of fertile uh, thought that came from some old man and uh, find new life. You know what I'm saying? I do. I know you 